Thank you. Thanks to the committee for this opportunity to um, educate you on my concerns. My background is as a molecular and cell biologist. I have a bachelor's and bachelor bachelor's and master's degree in molecular biophysics and biochemistry from Yale, a PhD in biology from MIT, several years of postdoctoral training, and then I came to Berkeley in 1995 as a professor. So I've spent the past 14 years um, teaching molecular and cell biology, and in particular teaching chromosome biology, DNA damage and repair, and cancer biology. My laboratory does primary research on that, and I teach it. So my um, presentation, what I will tell you, has to do with uh, what methylating agents, such as methyl iodide, what impact they have on our genetic code and on uh, the function of our cells. And I submit, Assembly Member Barry Hill, that it's never too early for a little bit of education. So um, uh, I, what I want to, I have a handout, but actually I want you to just put it down because it contains the literature references that are the support for what I'll tell you. You just have to listen to me. You know that there are four units in our genetic code. There are four building blocks. Um, and these four building blocks uh, have to be replicated and replicated and replicated. And so um, of these four building blocks, two of them are sensitive to the kind of damage that these methylating agents um, cause. Chemotherapy, several chemotherapy agents are act by methylating. So they're very toxic and they attack the genetic code of any replicating cell. So all the replicating cells in our body will get attacked by these methylating agents. And there's quite a lot of research on methyl iodide. There's three types of damage that are known to occur from methyl iodide, which is great because we can then track down what will happen to those kinds of damage. They damage two of the four units of the code. So there are three general responses to DNA damage in our cells. We're, we damage our DNA just by eating food, low levels of DNA damage. Uh, are repaired. We have many different mechanisms to repair these damage. So some types of methylation will be repaired. If the damage load is very high, like in the chemotherapy case, cells in multicellular organisms like us, they choose to die, they commit suicide to save the greater organism. So that's the principle of chemotherapy. You take a high lows, dose of something that overwhelms the repair system and the cells die. But there's a third consequence which is genome mutation. So certain kinds of mutagens are not just toxic in the short term, in the sense of causing damage or causing cell death, but they're mutagens in the sense that they change the code. And these are particularly frightening kinds of mutagens, particularly for long-lived organisms such as us. Because the way that we get cancer, the way that we get disease is cumulative. Every damage that changes the code, one damage may not do it, but there's a multi-hit theory of cancer where four mutations or five mutations combine together to give you cancer. So the toxicity you can see short term. Somebody's poisoned, they go to the hospital, you know, all the cells have killed themselves, they regrow that tissue. But this toxicity from changing the code is far more difficult to evaluate. So one of the three kinds of damage that's caused by methyl iodide is something called O6-methylguanine that you don't need to know. Um, but this is a particularly uh, insidious form of damage. In fact, most bacterial organisms have evolved pathways we don't have to fix this one thing in specific because it changes the code. There's a reason that it's so deleterious is that the DNA that's modified in this particular way, it looks like a normal part of the code, but actually it doesn't look like itself. It looks like one of the other four. So if there's four units in the code, the G doesn't look like a G anymore. The G now looks like an A. So when it goes to be copied, you've actually changed the code. It can be repaired, but if it's not repaired, it changes the code in a permanent way. And these permanent damages add up to cause high carcinogenesis. Now, I also want to add a note that all of the studies in the literature that estimate carcinogenicity or toxicity in terms of long-term genetic stability, they're done on mice because there's, you know, morally less obligation to killing the mice. But mice live for two years. Mice do not get the spectrum of cancers that we get. 
So in fact, all of those studies that are done on model systems that are short-lived underestimate the carcinogenicity of these compounds. Uh, and so you may not, I mean, I think that um, we have to be particularly worried about compounds where we can't, in a short-term manner, assess the risk. Um, finally, I just want to finish by saying that, um, as Neil commented at UC Davis, at UC Berkeley, we are not allowed to dispose of this compound to the environment in any manner. It is a zero-release compound. It is a class C toxin way higher than all the radioactivity that we use. We are not allowed to dispose of this into the environment because of the toxicity and because of its carcinogenicity. So if I wanted to use this in my lab, as if Neil wanted to use it in his lab, we would not be allowed to even dilute it infinitely and dump it down the sink. And if I proposed an application to use it in my lab, I would do a stack of paperwork, and this is, this is relevant here too, about why I absolutely had to use that compound. And if like you're saying, the habit is to use soil fumigants. I would actually have to say why I need to grow my strawberry with a soil fumigant. Are there alternate ways to grow strawberries? I would have to do a 10-year search of all the published literature to provide the rationale for why I wasn't asking a different question, not which soil fumigant to use, but how to grow, do, does growing strawberries need a soil fumigant? And so that's the level of burden that would be placed on me um, in an academic setting. And uh, that's, this is just for information. I obviously, you know, I'm not a member of a review board, but I'm saying that this is the kind of standard. The concern that um, UC Berkeley has and the regulations there are, are tight on methyl iodide. Thank you, Dr. Um, Collins. Appreciate your testimony.